Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who just stepped out of a six-day darkness retreat and straight into the darkness of the garage. Here is the captain. And I got a little poo on my shoe. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very excited to be featuring Hunter's Harvest Blood Orange Blonde from the creative brewers over at Second Crossing Brew Company. This is a wonderful blonde ale, and the good folks at Second Crossing added some delightful blood orange to jazz it up a bit. Garage grade, I might be a little high on this one, but I love blood orange, so I'm going to go with four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thanks to our friends that helped us out this week. First up, a big cheers and thank you to Sandy in Rockford, Ohio. And a big we like your jib to Kelsey in Johnston, Rhode Island. And last but certainly not least, we have Leslie in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and helped us fill up the fridge for this week's show and for that we thank you yeah b w e double r u n beer run make sure you go to truecrimegarage.com and sign up on the mailing list so you're in the know if we have a live event or if we have a promo code so you can save some money on the store page colonel that's enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Pain never goes away. For the family of those that are reported as last seen here, or last seen by who, posters have become synonymous with the missing. Missing posters or missing flyers. No one needs a definition or clarification. You can close your eyes and envision the template. When you are out and about, on occasion, you may see a poster or flyer, and you stop and you look and you make a mental note of some of the information listed. The poster or flyer headline, Missing, Last Seen, Seeking Information, and Have You Seen Me. Today's case, Denise Flum, is a case that is easily remembered for many reasons. But one of those is for the unique last name 
spelled P-F-L-U-M. The missing posters show us what she looks like. They contain all of the pertinent information that might help someone to identify her. Like Denise's missing poster on missingkids.org that reads, Missing since March 28, 1986. Missing from Connorsville, Indiana. Date of birth, January 14, 1968. Age now, 55, if she's still alive. A Caucasian female, missing since she was just 18 years old. With brown hair, brown eyes, and she is listed as 5 foot 6 inches tall and weighing about 135 pounds. This poster is complete with two photos of Denise that look like they were taken sometime during her senior year of high school. If we achieve nothing else in covering this story that spans several decades and has several suspects, we hope that at the very least we can tell you what the posters cannot. Denise Flum was last seen leaving her parents' home in Connersville, Indiana. It was Good Friday, just about a half past noon. She was going back to an area where she attended a party the night before. She was going to look for her purse. Almost 37 years later, and Denise has not come home. Like most cold cases, there have been plenty of tips, theories, and rumors. Some claim to know what happened to Denise. Some claim to know where she is buried. Detectives have talked to prisoners that say they know who was responsible. But also, like many cold cases, this case faces a key problem. Time. The Indiana State Police and the Fayette County Sheriff's Department have some physical evidence. They have some witness statements and incriminating statements made by suspects. But everyone stopped expecting Denise to return long ago. Sadly, they have been reserved to looking for her remains. Judy Flum, Denise's mother, said nine years ago that it is likely that someone killed Denise, but Judy still clings to some tiny amount of hope that Denise is alive somewhere. Judy says, quote, The pain never goes away. You learn to wall it off. And you go about your daily business. You don't think you're going to lose your mind like we did back then. Like we said, detectives have some physical evidence. They have some witness statements and incriminating statements made by suspects. But what will it take to finally catch a break in this case? Well, That likely will come in one of two forms, either getting a confession or finding her remains. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Denise Flum. Missing since March 28th, 1986, Denise Flum was just 18 years old when she vanished. And that's what this story really is to me. The first thing that jumps off the page here, Captain, is that she simply, poof, seems to disappear into thin air. Very few traces of this young woman. This is one of those stories. You hear them time and time again. One bad night, one bad day, and it turns into a lifetime of torment for a family, an endless heartache for a pack of friends. Portions of today's trailer leading into this case description and timeline came from a 2014 Indianapolis Star article by Christine Guerrera and a 1986 Palladium Item article by Harold Wiley. Now, what those missing posters cannot tell you is that Denise Flum was fun. She was likable. She had a bunch of friends. 
and all of her life's intermediate goals. She had them all planned out. She had worked very hard to lay the foundation of the path that stood in front of her, what likely would seem like a future that was just footsteps ahead of her. It was Denise's senior year at Connorsville High School in the Hoosier State of Indiana. Denise was 18 and all set to graduate with the end of the school year just months away. She was sixth in her class, and one teacher referred to Denise as a perfectionist. Well, like you said, she was sixth in her class, but she also played three sports. Yeah, beyond the typical high school curriculum, she played softball, basketball, volleyball, and she was a longtime member of the science club. But more importantly, at Connorsville High School, Denise ran track, and she was hoping to secure a track scholarship. After graduation, the plan was to go off to the neighboring state of Ohio and attend Miami University in the fall. She planned to study microbiology. March 27, 1986 was a Thursday, and on that Thursday night, Denise and friends attended a local high school party. She went to the party with one of her closest friends. Her name is Kim. This was that time, that time of year, that time in most people's lives, and a time that most of us have been fortunate enough to experience. You've already put in all of the hard work. High school graduation was imminent. It was that short little window of time that goes by so fast. But it is a time that one can focus on socializing and creating some last-minute memories with high school friends both new and old before shipping oneself off into the uncharted waters of a college that may be far away. But as we already said, in Denise's case, Miami University, it was just about 30 miles or so away from home, just far enough that one could spread their wings a bit, but close enough to keep tight with family. This party here is a great place to start off our timeline, leading up to Denise going missing. This party was on a Thursday, and it was going to be hopping. Yeah, the party was going to be hopping, you nerds. Now, it's spring break this week, and the kids were ready to gather and throw down. From my understanding, Captain, a lot of the locals traveled out of town and out of state for a big spring break getaway, but not Denise. She had track to attend to. She had school and other things that she was concerned with. And so she was going to do a bit of a staycation, if you will, and hang out with some friends. Denise attended the party that night, as did about 100 or so other students. Now, this is curious to me because I've reviewed many reports on the timeline of Denise going missing. The number of persons attending this party seems to be up for debate. I've seen it reported as few as 100 people or 200 people maybe even as many as a few hundred people, which seems a bit exaggerated to me. It sounds like the fish that I caught when I was on vacation that keeps getting bigger and bigger every time I tell the story. There were only so many people that attended Connorsville High School. This was not a huge town. This is a small town. Back then, I believe the population was about 17,000 people. And with some of them out traveling for spring break, I question how much of a, quote, high school party this was. How many adults do we have attending this big party? But it was a typical party where they'd have a bonfire. In those scenarios, you have a lot of people coming and going, maybe staying for a beer and then leaving. On the way to the party, Kim and Denise stopped off at a place called the Greenwood Inn. This was to buy beer to take with them to the party. Now, her purse becomes a big portion of this story, and I want to go ahead and throw out there that I have a lot of questions about this purse situation. So we're going to jump in and out of the purse situation from time to time throughout our timeline here. But for our story, the way that this is typically reported is that she left her purse at this party and then would need to go and retrieve it the following day. I found it interesting that once you dive a little bit deeper into the story that she actually misplaced the purse at the party and was aware of that situation before leaving that night. That she was seen, and there are several people that have stated 
that they saw her or spoke with her and she was actively looking for her purse at the party. With all those other reports, the shorter versions, I had just made the assumption as it was reported that she had left her purse there like so many of us do, leave your phone somewhere, leave something else and then have to retrieve it later that evening or the following day. But no, her purse was misplaced sometime during the party, and she was actively looking for it. And at some point, she leaves the party and goes home. So other than missing her purse, losing her purse at the party, everything seems pretty normal on this Thursday evening and night. So March 27th is the party. She wakes up on the 28th, and obviously she's concerned because she doesn't have her driver's license. She doesn't have any money. So she wants to head back to where the party was, and now that it's daylight, maybe she'll be able to find her purse. That's correct. So she decides to venture out around 12.30 p.m. Denise left her home to retrieve her purse. And as the captain pointed out, she's leaving the home with simply her car keys and her vehicle. And she has no money. She has no identification or driver's license because those items are in her purse that she lost the night before. And her family is aware that she's going to be heading back to the party site to try to look for her purse. Now, the party site is only about 15 minutes away from her home. The interesting thing here is it's obvious to everyone that Denise, for whatever reason, did not want to go alone to go looking for this purse. We know this because she called a few of her friends two of them, in fact, that we have names for, that she asked, hey, can you go with me back to where the party was? I need to find my purse. Both of her friends that she spoke to were unable to go with her. Now, there's some question as to what this could mean here. It could be just as simple as a teenager that doesn't want to miss out on hanging out with some friends. Hey, could you join me for this errand that I need to run? Or... Was there something else going on here where she did not want to go alone back to that location of the party to retrieve her purse? Denise's house was about seven miles outside of Connorsville, and so this party location, it's pretty remote. So I could see somebody going, there's nothing out there. There's nobody out there. I'd like for somebody to come with me. And we know the time that she left for two factors. One, her younger sister was at home at the time. And again, this is around 12.30 p.m. And on her way out, Denise stopped and briefly had a conversation with one of her neighbors. The conversation with her neighbor is believed to be and reported to be the last confirmed sighting of Denise. Now, fast forward to later that evening when Denise doesn't return home that night. Her parents, of course, they begin to worry. This is not like their very responsible daughter to not return home. Well, she was also known to check in a lot. So her mom starts calling the house, I think, at round two. So within an hour and a half, her mom's going, there's, there's something wrong because she hasn't come home yet. And like I said, it's not that far of a drive out to, to the party site. And you're exactly right. Mom got a very uneasy feeling very early on in this case. Now, her parents, they're nervous. They don't know why Denise has not returned. So, of course, they go to local law enforcement and they report their daughter is missing. They try to inform the police and ask for their help. However, it's 1986. The person we're talking about is only 18 years old. And, of course, the cops are telling mom and dad, don't worry about it. She probably took off with some friends. She'll be back late tonight. She'll be back in the morning. It's spring break. Who knows what's going on? She'll return. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but I have a big problem with this with law enforcement. Your job is to serve and protect. This is maybe a 15-minute drive out to the party site from their location, maybe 20 at tops. Send a cruiser out there. Just a check on her. Yeah, this is something I've always had an issue with, and we've talked about this plenty of times here in the garage. And you can understand it's one of those debatable items, one of those one of those arguments where you can sympathize with the police department and say, well, they 
you know, you get these reports of these teenagers and then 99% of the time they turn up, no harm, no foul. Other than they weren't where they were supposed to be. They've done upset mom and dad. And it's as simple as that. Now, on the other side of that argument is where you empathize with the parents and with the loved ones in the family. And you say, my God, man, help us out here. We, we are coming to you. We, we put a lot of thought into coming to you. We didn't just show up willy nilly. This is about eight hours after she was last seen our daughter's sixth in her class. This isn't like her. She's not someone that runs the streets. She's not someone that's out all hours of the night. And as you said, Captain, she's somebody that regularly checks in with mom or dad. So this is incredibly out of character. The other argument that I have here is when we talk about these smaller towns, this seems more strange to me in these smaller towns. Now, I know 1986, a lot of things have changed since then. A lot of police departments and law enforcement agencies have changed their protocol for looking for missing persons much earlier than they would have in the 70s and the 80s. But when you have these smaller towns, <laughs> forgive me, small towns, but part of me goes, what else you got going on out there? Nothing, and that's the problem because uh, object at rest stays at rest. And mm -hmm. I think that's what happens is they go, well, we're not doing anything right now. So instead of getting off of our, getting off of our ass and looking for somebody, we're going to stay in lazy mode. And that's just the thing, man. You signed up for this job, likely not to be a hero, but as the captain pointed out, to serve and protect. And you find yourself, when you work as a first responder, you find yourself in a situation where you could end up being the hero. And this case needed a hero. Other than her parents and some people that come along much later in this investigation, I don't see a whole lot of heroes here in this case. Well, I don't even know if this case needs a hero as much as it just needs somebody to do their job that they signed up for. They took an oath. Like I said, 15 to 20 minute drive out there. And look, if something bad happened to her at that location, maybe there would be something that the officer would come across. Maybe another vehicle, maybe another person out there. You talk to detectives, we talk to detectives all the time, and one of the things that we hear about in these cold cases time and time again is, had we just spoke to the right person early enough in the investigation, had we just found this one piece of evidence that we know was covered up or discarded of later, if we would have found that earlier in our investigation, this would be a solved case. This would be a completely different situation. You and I, Captain, here might not be sitting here 30 some years later discussing Denise Flum still being missing. Now, what could have happened is the officer could have said, sure, give me the description of Denise. Heck, he or she may have even known the Flums. This was not a large town. Give us a description of her car. That's even more important because cops are very good at finding vehicles. Now, they don't go out looking. That does not stop her parents that does not stop her family from calling people they know. They're calling hospitals and businesses, calling friends, asking where Denise could be. They're rounding up people, and they're going out, and they're doing their own search, an unorganized one, but they are conducting their own search starting that night. As soon as they are turned away, for lack of a better word, from law enforcement, they start actively searching for their daughter. They were doing so before they showed up to law enforcement. But they continued the search that night and then on to the next day. It would be quite some time before law enforcement would get involved in the search for Denise Flum. The following day, we are now at March 29th. Denise's car is found parked near a farm. The car was parked alongside Tower Road. This is a gravel, small gravel lane or road that is east of Glenwood. And the car is parked near a barn. Yeah, technically the road is Fielding Road, but all the locals call it Tower Road. The landowner would later tell police that the vehicle hasn't left that spot where it was found since he says about 12.30 p.m. to approximately 1.15 p.m. the day before. This is interesting because this lines up with our timeline. We know that she left her home at approximately 12.30 p.m., the day before, 
And as the captain pointed out, we're talking about a 15 minute drive to get to where she needed to go to look for this purse. And so it would appear that if Denise took off or if something bad happened to her, that this vehicle was placed there by someone or Denise herself a relatively short time after she left her home. Yeah, and this this road, Tower Road, like the locals call it, is only four miles from the party site. But it's still strange because if you're looking for your purse, you're not going to find it four miles away. Right, right. Unless that purse grew legs, you're not finding it four miles away. Now, the interesting thing here, Captain points out four miles away. I've seen one report that says it's approximately a six-minute drive from the general party location from the night before. The point here is that according to multiple reports, there was no reason for Denise to be in that area where her car was found. So at this point, they're not able to find Denise, but like the colonel said, they found her vehicle. The vehicle is a white or cream-colored Buick Regal 1981 When the vehicle's found, the doors are locked and the keys are gone. And as said, no one could come up with a reason for the vehicle to be in that location. The family also believes that the car seat was in the position that Denise would normally have it in when she was driving. And there seemed like there was no crime scene or no sign of a struggle inside that vehicle. So there was pretty much no evidence around the vehicle. Also... It's a rural area. No footprints were found around the vehicle. Yeah, very interesting. And keep in mind that at the time when her vehicle is found, it's found when the family and friends are out searching for Denise. Police have not joined in the search effort at this time. Now, they once they find the vehicle, they report this to police, and now the police are getting involved. The police look it over. And they determine that there's no sign of a struggle. There's no sign of foul play as far as they can see regarding the vehicle, the condition of the vehicle. And the seat is in that normal position, the normal position that Denise would have left it in. This is according to her parents. And Denise, as we said, is five foot six inches tall. And we've seen in some cases where the seat position can be rather important because we may have a very short woman who owns the vehicle and the seat is found all the way extended away from the steering wheel, indicating a much taller person may have driven the vehicle. Here we have a situation where it's hard for me to tell given the description by the police and the pictures that I've seen and the statements from her parents. I think one could make a strong argument that Denise may have placed this vehicle there herself, or if somebody else did, They left little evidence behind to indicate that someone else moved this vehicle. After a rather quick assessment of Denise's car, the car is returned to Denise's parents. And unlike the vehicle, Denise never comes home. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. 
Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. Cheers to you, Captain. Now, this should be a homicide case, not a missing persons case. Denise had a lot of plans in place. She was excited for the future. She had a good home life. She was vocal and openly expressing to those she knew how excited she was for some of the upcoming events in her life. And we're talking about things like prom, graduation, going off to school. And mind you, she had an opportunity to go with friends on a trip out of town for spring break and chose not to because she wanted to stay and focus on her schooling, which the main reason was track. Track was starting up and was active at that time that week. And she wanted to stay involved with track. It was one of her passions. Well, this is my problem with law enforcement. They do this a lot in missing person cases where they tell the family, well, look, she probably ran away. And there's zero evidence that she ran away. We don't know if she ever found her purse. So as far as we know, she has no money. She has no identification. Like you said, there's evidence that she stayed in town to keep pursuing her goals. And then on top of that, law enforcement didn't even really search her car that well and didn't search her house. So it's not like they went back to her house and found journal upon journal of her wanting to escape her life or something. We've seen a bunch of these cases where it appears that we may have a missing person and then the missing person's case turns into a homicide investigation. And we've seen multiple times where a vehicle is found And it's returned to the family. Heck, we covered one case very recently, Gaitha Bowman, where I believe that the police returned the vehicle to the prime suspect. The vehicle is not processed properly, and there is a lost opportunity there for evidence that could lead you to what actually happened to Denise Flum. Well, I just think it's a common misstep by law enforcement. It needs to stop happening unless you have some evidence that they wanted to start a new life or they wanted to run away with somebody. I mean, it's not even like she had a relationship with somebody that was from out of town. There was, there's just no reason that she would want to take off. The other thing too, is I never understand why, especially in this case, when you have an 18 year old daughter, why the police aren't saying to mom and dad, Hey, it's probably nothing. We still think that there's an opportunity that she may return, but would you mind if we hold this vehicle in a secured location for X amount of days and to, in case this turns into something else, right? It, you could have lost evidence in this case, especially if this vehicle was moved by the person responsible for her disappearance. Yeah. Finding a fingerprint in that vehicle could be a a big deal. There's no doubt in my mind, mom and dad say, yes, please hold on to this car. And here's the other thing too. You find a person's vehicle, a missing person's vehicle. You look it over and you go, "Eh, I don't see a sign of struggle. I don't see any signs, obvious evidence of foul play. The vehicle itself being parked in a strange location with no person, with no owner to be found is in itself evidence of foul play in my mind. Yes, I agree. And the other problem that I keep going back to is why is this vehicle four miles away from the party site? Correct. She went to the party site to look for her purse. It would make sense if you found her car at the party site, but we don't. We find it four Mm -hmm. miles away on this gravel road, basically. One of the most heartbreaking parts of this story 
is Denise's parents. They, I watched a bunch of interviews with them, these short little news clips from 1986, where they keep saying, like, we don't believe she had any reason to run away. She was not that type, but we're hoping and praying that she ran away. Right. And you have her father on camera saying, me and her mother are questioning everything. Right. Did we not show enough affection? Did we not tell her that we loved her enough? We could have said it more, I guess. We we should have said it more. And it's this heartbreaking thing where you're constantly telling law enforcement and the media, please take this seriously because my daughter, she's not the type. She would not run away. But, oh, I'm praying and hoping that she did. Well, I think that's coming from law enforcement. I mean, the, the lead detective, Ted McQuinley, was also related to the father he was the cousin he was david's cousin yeah so i think then that becomes a there's a conflict of interest anyways you probably shouldn't be the lead detective if you are related to the father because look like i said it shouldn't be viewed as a missing person case it should be viewed as a homicide assume the worst thank you yes and then, and then work backwards and if evidence uh leads you to another path fine but at least you're doing your due diligence from the word go. But again, object at rest stays at rest. And t- to me, this is just it's just constant laziness by law enforcement. I like what you're saying here, Captain. So we easily agree this is most likely a homicide case. And since we have run out of breadcrumbs for our general timeline, I think going forward, we pursue this and discuss it as we would a homicide case. So typically we would talk about some of the persons that may be responsible for Denise to go missing. Let's talk about evidence or some things that could be evidence in this case. Before we get into some suspects, since this is a missing case, let's start off by talking about what exactly is missing. Simply put, we have Denise, her clothing that she was wearing that day, and her car keys. That's it. That's what is missing in this case. What is not missing is her car. As we know, it was found four miles from the party site. Right. And strangely enough, the other item that's not missing is her purse. Her purse was returned to her family the same day that Denise goes missing. So the purse is returned to her family, but what items do we find in that purse? That's very... That's a very good question here. And that's one of the big big problems that I have with this case. I believe there are so many things that are missing from this timeline. I believe that there are witnesses that have statements that are missing. And I believe that there's a lot of evidence that could clue us into what may have happened or give us a bigger picture, a bigger, better picture of what happened. And we simply don't have a lot of that stuff. And I think it's because... And I hate to do this two weeks in a row, but I just see a poor investigation from Jump Street in this case. Well, and I'm just going to piggyback off that for a little bit. I I agree. This this investigation is horse shit, for one, but there are a couple of things working against law enforcement. Like you said, 100 plus people at this party and anybody that's been to a bonfire knows that there could be crowds of people around the fire and you might go to that bonfire you might be there for an hour you might have a couple drinks but you're not in a well-lit area where you see everybody so there could have been i've gone to bonfires before where one of my buddies was at the bonfire i just never saw them so i think one to identify all the individuals that were at this party there's also rumors that she was making out with some guy john that night that person, John, I I don't know has, if, if he's ever been fully identified. And then I think the other issue for law enforcement is this happens during spring break. So you have a bunch of kids out of town, and then the kids that you have in town, there's no school that day. It's Good Friday. So now all those individuals, normally if a girl went missing, let's say on a Friday at noon or 1230, the majority of the people that you would want to question, their alibi would be school. 
they would be in school, but because they're not in school, now every person that you interview, you have to figure out what their alibi is, and then you have to follow up on that lead to make sure that the alibi is correct. Well, and you're right. With so many people potentially at this party, what we should have here is one of your favorite words, Captain, a plethora. A plethora. A plethora of witness statements of people that saw her that night, spoke with her that night, or guess what's also important? The ones that didn't speak to her and didn't see her that night. What else did they see? What else did they hear while they were there? Now, we talked about how big could this party be? Well, we know that she went with her friend Kim, and from one report that I've seen is that her senior class had 348 students in this class. Now, that could mean that 300 of those 348 went to that party, like one report states. Most reports say 100 to maybe 200 kids. But what's interesting to me here is that based off of the report that I'm looking at in front of me right now, we gain some information, not a lot, but the information here is that Kim Gilbert and Melissa Cook, both seniors at Connorsville High School, were good friends with Denise Flum. These were two of the persons that she called on that day before she left her home to go look for her purse. These are two of the people that she called to ask if they would go with her. Neither was able to. They were unable to go. So now she heads out on her own. And then what we are told later is she goes out looking for this purse. She vanishes, poof, disappears into thin air, as it would appear. Never returns home. They find her vehicle and her purse made its way home. And I've seen two reports. One report says that it was returned to the Flum's house about an hour and a half after Denise left to go looking for it. And the person that brought the purse to them, from my understanding, was somebody that was pretty to fairly well known to the family. This wasn't any kind of mystery person to them. The person has remained unidentified. They're not listed by name in any of the reports that I've seen. But what's crazy is this purse makes its way back home. Denise does not. Now, that leads me to what is missing from this case. As we stated, Denise, her clothing and her car keys, all missing. But what also is missing from this case is background statements for that party, background, a background story on the purse itself, witness statements. Here's the thing. When she drove out there to retrieve her purse, who was she hoping to meet? Was she hoping to meet up with somebody once there? Was she hoping to speak with somebody once there? Help me find my purse or now that nobody's here everybody's left from last night did you happen to see my purse well that's another thing that's not clear did everybody at this bonfire leave or did some people just crash in their car or did people set up some tents i mean i've been to bonfires before where at the end of the night a couple people just set up some tents and just stay the night and so was it found by a person that went back out to the party or was it somebody that woke up at the party or did they find her purse last night. These are questions that should be easily answered and they should have been easily found out. This information should have been easily found out by detectives and law enforcement. And I know it sounds like we are a couple vultures circling around one small item here, but here's where my head is, Captain. I don't think we're circling around one item. I think there's a bunch of things that we're a little pissed off about. I feel like this... My gut feeling is that this party and her disappearance could have a lot to do with one another. Yeah. Duh. What happened at that party? And the thing, too, with the statement of there's a statement out there in multiple reports that says she did not want to go alone to retrieve her purse. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Did she Was she just simply a busybody that liked to be hanging out with people all the time and didn't want to really do anything by herself? Or... Is there a reason why she didn't want to go alone? Was she afraid? Did something happen the night before at the party that made her uncomfortable, made her uncomfortable to go alone to retrieve her purse? 
And what's the backstory on the purse itself? It could be just as simple as she set it down somewhere, misplaced it. Or is there something more nefarious going on here? Did somebody take it from her as a, a prank? Did she set it down and somebody took it on purpose? When it was returned, what items were in the purse? We, we talked about her having no money and no identification because those items were in her purse when she left on that Friday. Was there money in her purse when it was returned to the family? Yeah, my gut feeling is just, one, it's a royal area, so maybe she just wanted somebody to go with her because she wouldn't feel safe out there by herself. And also, if you bring somebody, it's probably quicker to find the purse yep. with two people looking. Yeah, I would love to hear some background statements for the party itself. Yeah, uh, who's this John guy? Yeah, who's the John guy? The other thing, too, we talk about the things she was looking forward to in her life. One of them being prom, another being graduation, then, of course, going off to college in the fall. But one of the persons of interest here in this case will be her ex-boyfriend. And it's reported that her and her ex-boyfriend broke up about a month before Denise went missing. Well, what would be interesting to know, too, is if her and her boyfriend, his name is Sean McClung, if they were broken up, who was she going to go to prom with? Because what you have here all these years later is people saying Sean McClung was not looked at good enough early on in this investigation. And I agree with those statements 1,000%. However, who was she going to go to prom with? Who was she in a current relationship with or hoping to have a re relationship with? Was she just going by herself, just going with friends? That's not uncommon. Is it possible that she was still in contact with her ex-boyfriend and that maybe they were going to go together? Because they were together for three years, which is a, that's a long time. That's a very long-term relationship for somebody so young. And Lieutenant Ted McQuinley, as we said, he was the lead investigator on this case early on, back in 1986. And when he is asked years later about the ex-boyfriend, Sean McClung, he simply says, yeah, I spoke with him. He had an alibi for that time period. He was out fishing with some friends. But it doesn't seem like there was a whole lot of follow-up on Sean. Well, I don't think he ever confirmed the alibi. So, Correct. So law enforcement comes to me and goes, what were you doing that day? Well, I was uh, fishing with uh, Jim and Steve. Well, if you don't ever go ask Jim and Steve, then that's not an alibi. That's just a story that I've told you. And my issue, too, with him, again, step down. become Don't be the lead detective if you're related to the family. Because, look, in these cases, especially... The 18 year old, you got to start with the inner circle. Well, that inner circle is your cousin, your yeah. cousin's wife. Now you have to, what about the sister? Okay. Now we got to look at relationships, current relationships and past relationships. And one thing that I failed to put in my notes here, captain, is that I do not know if Ted McQuinley was with the local police department or with the sheriff's department at the time, which I think could have some important meaning to it because I would imagine a town of 16 to 17,000 probably does not have a very large Connorsville police department. He may have been the only investigator. That's true. But at the time, but, but we, we do have or at least I heard that Indiana State Police did offer assistance. So even if you stay on as the lead, why aren't you getting some assistance from them? That, that, look, I, I get so tired of these cases. You, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You just have to know the smartest guy in the room. And, and you become the smartest guy in the room when you place smart individuals that are qualified around you. And Ted, Lieutenant McQuinley here, seems to have really bought into this idea of, and, and I'm sure he, he may have had other people than just Sean McClung telling him this, but he seemed to have moved on rather quickly from Sean McClung 
Yeah, you're moving on pretty quickly when you're not following up to see if his alibi is actually legit. He simply seems to do this because he believes the narrative of that they were still friends, that it was a mutual breakup, that they were still friendly, that nobody was mad at one another. And again, this could this is very likely backed up by other students, other people. But still, you double check these alibis and you look at this guy. One thing, if you you want to talk about spinning your tires here and going completely in the wrong direction, it sounds to me like they spent more time looking into Denise's father than they did Sean McClung back in the day. Because one thing they state emphatically is that David, Denise's father, was miles away with multiple people that were interacting and hanging out with him that day that that friday leading up to the point where he becomes aware that she's missing so i i I just have a hard time understanding why they went and verified those alibis right but not sean mcclung's well they did that with the father but they also do that with the mother so that they're able to make the statement to the public that we have cleared these individuals which that's great okay but we're still talking about the inner circle close friends family members current or past boyfriends or current or past relationships, however you want to look at it. And it just seemed like they did the first couple steps of the inner circle. And then they just, again, uh, we'll just get lazy. And the, my other issue too, is this, (laughs) this dumbass doesn't take any notes. So when you ask him about this stuff, he can't even refer back to his notes. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, how are you investigating this? Oh, it's just, it's up in, it's up in my noggin. Again, him being the lead investigator might be more of a seniority situation, more of a, he, he rose to that rank because of attrition rather than being a great investigator or detective. You got to take a lot of notes. You got to write everything down because you do not know Two weeks from now, three weeks from now, what seems to be insignificant today could become very significant to your investigation. Well, and the notes aren't necessarily for you because you take these notes because if this case doesn't get solved and you get moved to a different department, then when you have new detectives coming in and you have no notes, then they're basically starting at square one. And hoping that you remember anything. And I know that, you know, the, you know, there's a really good documentary about this case. And I know when they were asking him, it's, you know, 30 some years later. So he's not going to remember anything. But again, you could refer back to your notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that documentary is called Small Town Secrets. And it is available, currently available on vicetv.com. It's a three-parter. It's a very good, very well put together documentary on this case it's one of the best true crime documentaries i've seen in the last few years and a cheers to nicole bezergmore and gianna tobani for that wonderful documentary i hope i pronounce their last names correctly kudos to you and for doing a gangbusters job on that documentary small town secrets now we want to talk about notes somebody not taking notes, well, here's some notes that become important and it's not brought into the light until a good deal of time later. We talk about Sean McClung not being looked at, his alibi is not being checked, but it seems like old Ted McQuinley moved on from him because everybody's saying, well, they stayed friends and it seemed like a mutual breakup. Yeah, it's almost like Ted took the time out to talk to Sean and then just bought everything that Sean was selling. The notes that I'm talking about come from one of Denise's friends who had moved away and they stayed close and they became pen pals because of the distance between them. So she's writing letters to her friend and she's telling her friend leading to the breakup with her current boyfriend, Sean, that, you know what? I recently made what she refers to in the letter as a life or death mistake i made a fatal mistake i mean it says in the letter life or death now 
we don't have that complete letter to clue us into what she means by that statement. What she's talking about, though, is she's telling her friend, I cheated on my boyfriend and I'm getting ready to tell him. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to confess. She's an honest person. She's not going to try to hide this secret. She's going to tell Sean, this is what I've done and, and take it from there. So she tells Sean. And I don't know that this immediately led to their breakup, but from my understanding, he was incredibly disappointed. He was hurt. He appreciated her honesty and they broke up some time after that. The notes I have state that she dated that letter to her friend March 3rd. And we know that she would go missing before the end of March. And we have the other two friends statements saying that they broke up roughly a month before she went missing. So we know the date of the letter, but we don't know exactly the date that she had this conversation with Sean. But it seems based on what Sean is saying, based on other people that they broke up March 6th. So like you said, about a month before she went missing. Yeah, that all lines up with the timeline I have in front of me as well. But again, if you're law enforcement, it's who's this individual that she slept with? And that's somebody that you would at least want to question. Did she continue to have a relationship with that person? Or did she cut that off when she cut off the relationship with Sean? And was this person looked at and cleared? Was this person looked at even more finely than you looked at Sean McClung? Was this person John, who she may or may not have been making out with at the party the night before? Was this person the same person she may be attending prom with? Or was John the person she was attending prom with? These are the things that you need to know. If you're going to look at, if I'm, I'm just a little confused why they didn't look at Sean McClung more closely early on in this investigation. Part of me, I'm, I'm a, a blue backer here, right? I, I, I do my best to stand with the, the women and men in blue, but you got to call it like you see it. And from what's been reported, it doesn't look like there was a great job that was going on early in this investigation. Part of me wants to believe captain that that was because they had other people that they were looking at that they were more interested in at that time. And could it have been whoever she was in a current relationship with, but it's this simple. If you're able to confirm his alibi for that Friday, Sean's done. Right. You never have to go back to him. Right. You can now ask him questions about her character and maybe other rumors. Now he becomes somebody that is an ally for law enforcement. Now, there's a couple things about Sean that I kind of dismiss when people say, well, Sean didn't help with the search ever or he never made contact with her family i don't find that to be that strange he's he's young he's towards the end of his high school career so he's going to be heading off into the real world they did break up a month ago which might not seem that long but when you're in high school a month is a very long time He claims he was already seeing some other girls. So maybe he was seeing somebody and he didn't feel comfortable making contact. So I don't find that to be as strange as some other people do. What I keep going back to that is strange is you didn't confirm his alibi. Exactly. And the thing too is we talk about him not participating in searches. Those are, keep in mind, they're not organized searches. Yes. This is the family and friends conducting their own search. And again, even if the breakup was mutual, even if they stayed friends, it's widely reported by multiple people that the two of them were living very different lifestyles leading up to the breakup. So they're together for like three years. Sure, they probably shared a lot of common interest early in that relationship, but by that senior year, they were both going down two very different paths and very likely had very different social circles. By that point, Denise was very honed in on her schoolwork and all of her extracurricular activities like playing sports, 
volleyball, basketball, running track. She was building her future. She had plans to go off to college. And then on the flip side of that, you have Sean McClung, who was very much into the party lifestyle at that time and had a bunch of party partier friends at that time, his senior year. The thing that, that I cannot shake here shake and bake. is where is the report from the person or persons that hosted that party? Right. Because we talk about the last, and I said, I purposely said that is believed to be the last confirmed sighting. Well, it is so far the last confirmed sighting of Denise, but we know at least one other person saw her after the neighbor that she spoke to on her way out that day. Where is the statements from police from the person or persons that hosted the party the night before? I It could be something as simple as, we know she went, her intention was to go and find her purse. That Friday afternoon, around 1230, 1 o'clock, 130, did she? Did you see her? Did you interact with her? Did she ask about her purse? And then where is the statement from the person that returns the purse? Where did they find it? Who did they get it from? When did they obtain it? These things, I think, are very key to this case and very interesting to me because, again, you go back to the, the landowner who says her vehicle that you find the following day, yeah, it's been there since about 1230 to 130 yesterday. That's not too long after she left her house. All right, we want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage. So much more to get to. Thank you. And for everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com. And until tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.